We're talking to the chairman of Henley & Partners today. They work with clients who want to gain citizenship to certain countries and they're willing to pay for it. Now joining me here in the studio right now is Chris Kalin, who's actually the chairman of Henley & Partner. We always read and hear about what is the most powerful passport. Your company has just recently released the Passport Index. Tell us what are the biggest takeaways from that and where do Swiss citizens fit into the picture? Thank you. You know, this Passport Index that we created so over 10 years ago is something that is quite a simple measure because it simply measures to how many countries you can go to visa-free with your own passport. And it has shown remarkable changes over time and it gives an interesting geopolitical view mm -hmm. in a way of the world. And what we've seen most interestingly is there is a big uh, rise in Asian nations actually. So you now have Japan number one, number two is Sing uh, South Korea and Singapore, which is quite remarkable over time. These uh, countries have increased their visa-free access across the world. And what is also very interesting if you look at the UAE for instance has over time change from a fairly restricted passport where you couldn't really travel very far mm -hmm. to one of the better ones worldwide. It's now, I think, in, on among the top 20 or so. It's really remarkable. You've you know? pointed out a few trends, you know, with the rise of the UAE and Asia. Does Switzerland stand to lose its place on the ranking? Right now it's about sixth. But as more of these com uh, countries jump on top of Switzerland, do we lose yeah, on the ladder? Yeah, certainly the traditional nations that have been on top of this index, which is largely American and European, they go down a little bit. But of course, Switzerland is still <laughs> amongst the top 10 and probably will remain, um, except that we gave up our visa policy to the EU, essentially being in Schengen. This is a, mm -hmm. another a story here. But, you know, generally speaking, also, don't forget that this passport index is a very crude measure. So more detailed would be the quality of nationality index, which we also created a few years ago, which much more detailed assesses the real quality of each nationality. Because obviously it's a different thing, you know, when you have access visa-free, say, to the United States or maybe to some small country or a country that is maybe not even desirable to go to. Mm -hmm. Each of them give one point um, in this passport index, whereas a much more detailed analysis would be our quality of nationality index, which, which I and a, a professor produce, and that's much more detailed. You're Swiss yourself. Yeah, I'm very Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> what happens if Switzerland does drop out of the Schengen? Actually, I think for Switzerland, I wouldn't be worried at all. And, no. what, and why is that? Because Switzerland is a global brand. It is a very good, peaceful, neutral, and internationally well-respected country. It's probably equally well respected as many other larger countries. It's very interconnected globally. So it has a completely globalized economy. So I don't think that would make any difference, actually. Your company. Same like with the UK now with Brexit, by the way, excuse me. <laughs> your, your company, actually speaking of citizenship, actually facilitates and helps people to gain residency and citizenship. You've been in this business for quite a while. Tell us a story of when someone paid an exorbitant amount to try and get their foot into another country? I don't think actually you need to pay an extraordinary amount. It's sometimes quite simple. It's sometimes as simple as finding that your grandparent was Irish, for instance, and you have the right to an Irish citizenship. It might be a simple application that you can even do yourself. But if you're not fortunate enough to have that, or you don't, um, say, for business or personal reasons, relocate to a particular country and later become a citizen, which is also the, the, the possibility, you know, if you move to the United States for a few years and then naturalize as an American, you become American and get another passport in America, for instance. That's quite easy. But if you're not fortunate enough to have this possibility, then there is the possibility to invest in a country and obtain residence and or uh, citizenship as well. And this is what we do and what we help people around the world to obtain. And we help countries to attract those individuals to help with uh, economic and socio-economic needs of the countries. What are the biggest reasons behind uh, this movement of people? I mean, what themes are you starting to see? Well, I think what we need to understand on a very broad scale is that migration is as old as humanity. In fact, this is one of the key factors of the human development, is migration. People always moved. 
This is nothing new. People always moved also for these reasons that we have today. They moved because things were better elsewhere, because they saw opportunities, because of personal reasons, for, for, many, for many different. And what we do, we look at specific area of possibility through investments. So people invest in other countries and thereby relocate or simply obtain residence or citizenship rights. And so in the most recent past, we simply have had an enormous trend now developing where both countries and also individuals worldwide seek this kind of connection that people look at countries to obtain residence and citizenship and countries look at individual investors globally how they could bind them to them and invest in their countries to help with economic development. So which is the country that people most are, are gravitating towards, which tends to be the most attractive? You can't say this generally because it depends where and from which perspective you look at. So if you look at it, if you want to get um, you know, absolutely first-rate alternative citizenship, certainly probably European countries are, are number one. Austria, Malta, and so on, where you can obtain citizenship through investment. But, you know, if you want to relocate and do business in North America, maybe it's better you have an investor permit in the United States, an EB-5 visa, and you have access to the United States. If you are working in Asia and do business there, maybe it's easier for you and better to apply for a residence permit in Thailand and make your hub in Bangkok or in Singapore. It's it depends, you know, it really depends on, your, on the individual, on their aims, where in the world they are. It, the world is a big place. Of course, it, it also depends on personal factors, but there are also some trends that are starting to emerge, and I'm talking more specifically about the movement of high net worth individuals. How has that changed since you entered the business, for example? Well, one thing that is very clear is you see a lot of people moving out, so a lot of high net worth people moving out of countries that are either problematic um, politically. No, take Venezuela. It's, it's clear that people would want to leave if they can, or at least have a plan B if it gets even worse. So if you're a Venezuelan family, it's totally natural that you would want to look at alternatives, both in terms of residence and probably citizenship, because the current regime may not renew your passport because you may not agree with the current government. So this makes a lot of sense. Or take, say, South Africa. A South African family today would like to stay in South Africa. There's a lot of possible, you know, good development in South Africa, but also we don't know, does it end up like Zimbabwe? And besides that, on a South African passport, it's very difficult to travel. You need a visa everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, so it makes a lot of sense for you to look at that and for the future for your kids to maybe be able to study in Europe, get a residence permit there, and thereby have a, a plan B and more mobility, more security. Your company advises clients on, on the Citizen by Investment program, or so-called golden passports. Um, this is quite a controversial business. And do you actually market yourself as one of the earliest movers in this space? How do you navigate such a controversial business when you have criticisms coming at you from left and right? Of course, you know, what we do is at the very center of uh, a very important political topic that is immigration and citizenship. So in every country, this is an issue. And to make this available for an investment, in other words, for money, clearly, you know, is something that raises eyebrows in many people's, uh, in, in many corners. But what you need to see is the fact today is that people don't really look at citizenship in effect in the way like you would look at it really politically, you actually look at it more like a club membership in, in reality already. It's only some politicians, some particular actors that make actually a big deal out of this at the moment that, you know, what you say, criticizes in this way. Of course, for obvious reasons, but the reality is today in, in open societies, people are interested, what do I get from the state and what do I pay? And if you look at it this way, it is more like a club membership. And what is there to say not to open this to very well qualified, to very few very well qualified people, to admit them if they contribute significantly? And I'm convinced that in 10 years' time, it will be the norm. How do you think you can actually shake off this image that it is 
in fact, these programs are being used for money laundering and tax evasion. How will you get people to say this is a clean industry? Because it's and simply factually wrong. And over time, the facts will be very clear. In fact, it is already now clear, but, you know, a lot of people, for instance, what you just said, you know, it's just completely not true. You, you say it's factually this is, it, Yeah, but it, it's very clear that this is not true. It's just a question of time that people start to realise this more and more. And this is happening already. So I'm, I'm not worried about it. I think it just needs time. Like with many other things, you know, when you are pioneering something, you always have a lot of criticism first, because people don't really understand. And they repeat things that actually are many, many times not true, like the fact that how, how can you launder money with alternative residence or citizenship? You need a financial system for that, not mm -hmm. residence or citizenship. I want to bring it back to Switzerland. Right now, we're seeing that potentially we're going through tax reforms. We might be leaving the Schengen. How is that all going to play a role in your business going forward? I think there are two answers to that. First mm -hmm. of all, for our business, it makes no difference whatsoever. Just like Brexit makes no difference, because there will be a little bit more people interested in coming and a little bit more in leaving. But that for our business, it makes no difference, because we are in 30 countries around the world. And so we're not just in Switzerland or in England or somewhere. We are from Hong Kong to North America. From my personal point of view, as still a Swiss citizen, you know, I think that Switzerland should be much more strong in their position because I think very often times in recent past we have been too weak. And when you see now to Britain what's happening between this Brexit discussions between the EU and Britain, you could see a little bit in the direction this goes. So, but that's not for me, you know, to, to judge. So from a business point of view, it doesn't matter. You know, it actually really will be a bit of plus and a bit of minus, depends how you look at it, but it doesn't matter at all. Mr. Kalen, thank yeah. you very much. Thanks a lot. There's still plenty more to come here on the Swiss Pulse, but first, here's a look at your weather.